thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm very, very excited to welcome Gabriela Hurst to our series of, uh, of conversations. Uh, deeply grateful to Elena Foster for not only having the idea for this series of talks, but also introducing us some months ago to, to Gabriela. And uh, Gabriela, I wanted to begin with the beginning because one thing which I find so fascinating is that a lot of your work with sustainability actually has to do with the very beginnings. You told me the other day about growing up on a ranch and how important this experience of the countryside has been for you. Can you tell us about the beginnings? Well, thank you for having me, Hans and, and Elena and all the Serpentine patrons. Um, I, I grew up in, in a, this uh, very uh, remote place. And when I talk remote, it's really remote. Two hours and a half from the closest town. Um, that's where my family's been there since the 1850s. And um, we, I, I learned two things. We grew up sustainably. But out of a utilitarian aspect, that was the way to grow, you know, with the with the blankets that were knitted from the sheep that we had in the farm. Um, my mother still lives off the grid now. Of course, she has solar panels, um, but there was it was there was no really electricity when I was growing up there. It was just a, a, a motor that was used a few hours before going at night. And so I learned about sustainability and everything gets repurposed and reused. And also I learned about quality because you make things that last. Um, quality from a utilitarian aspect as well, not, a utility, not an ostentatious thing. So things need to last. And so you sit in your great grandmother's chairs and everything. You have few things, but of high quality. So that's how the way we lived and, and uh, consume. And who, how would you say did fashion come to you or how did you come to fashion? Was there an epiphany or was it a gradual awakening? And I was also curious, I mean, Panofsky says the future is often invented with fragments from the past. So I was wondering also who were the designers from previous generations who, who inspired you, who, who gave you courage? So fashion... There was not even a fashion school for me growing up in Uruguay, so it wasn't something that I actually was part of of a, an option. But I was always fascinated by clothes, and I guess the er, early images is to to thanks to Walt Disney Cinderella movie when Cinderella gets transformed by the little mice um, into this beautiful gown, and that made something on my psyche because immediately I went to my grandmother's closet and started catching her lace sleeping gowns and silk that were all handmade. And so I wanted, to, immediately I felt the power that clothes had to transform people. And I wouldn't be a designer if I didn't believe in that power. And and I've always been designing clothes and my, we had, my mother used to have her clothes made by the seamstress that was also making my grandmother's clothes. So we've always been involved with making our own clothes in, a, in an uh, indirect way. So no one is surprised that I end up uh, being a fashion uh, designer um, or I call myself more of a luxury designer because I pay a lot of attention to where the ingredients come from. But if I would have to say a designer that I would have loved to have met and spent time with would be Elsa Scaparelli, just because of how she started. She started working with her network with Armenian refugees um, and then collaborating with some of the most incredible artists that uh, we know today, Giacometti, Dali. So I think that that would be, that would be a designer that um, I would have loved to spend some time with, for sure. And artists, uh, because of course Chaparelli has these collaborations with, uh, with artists, were artists important for you at the beginning? Artists, oh, I, in my country, art is, it's very important. We actually have artists in our currencies. We have poets and uh, uh, painters and lyricists. Culture is really something very important, even when we come from a small country like Uruguay. So culture is something that we revered. Um, and artists were, was always part. I don't consider myself an artist. I consider myself a, a creative um, individual that process my work through creativity. I think that artists have the sole responsibility to self-express. Mine is a dialogue 
with our women, with our consumer. So it's not about self-imposing my vision only. It's about a communication of what desire is. So, so I, but I do get inspired by, by art. There's never a visit to any place where or, or nature that um, really triggers. Um, so it's always involved in that, in that sense. Do you remember what was the first museum you visited as a, as a kid? What was your first museum experience? Oh, our um, national, national gallery, but we have this artist that passed away recently in Uruguay called Carlos Paez Vilaró. I don't know if you heard about him. He lived in this really surreal house in, in the beach on Punta del Este. And he was such a Yeah, he had a Gesamtkunstwerk, no? Yeah. It was yeah. a kind of a total work of art. Yes, yes. I read yeah, the whole it. house was a work of art. The, and he was such an um, icon that when he passed away, he was, um, he, he was, uh, he had all his funeral done in the parliament. I mean, were presidents and politicians, um, they have their funerals. It was done for, for him. So Carlos Paez Villaro is definitely that type of, of work. And, and for me, I think Torres Garcia is the guy that really triggered um, a lot of uh, the thinking. It's very much of a part of our currency and part of, uh, of uh, the way we, we look at Uruguay in this abstract way. When you're so remote, it's usually, but there's a lot of amazing artists that are emerging from Uruguay that have been, you, they had to have a second profession. So. And when would you say, did you then find your language in terms of design? Because I think it's interesting, you know, with artists, uh, they kind of have a catalogue raisonné and they say, you know, there is student work and then at a certain moment, it's the beginning of the catalogue raisonné and usually getting numbered sometimes later. What would you say in terms of your work with fashion was the, the item or the object or the project where you feel you had found your, your language? You know, I've been designing since 2003 professionally, meaning I, I make clothes, I sell it, I live from this. Um, and it was the project of Gorilla Hearst, uh, where I actually put my name on, on a label that that woman crystallized and, and really the vision became very, very clear. And so I don't know if I'm a late bloomer or not, but it was in my late 30s that this really happened to me where I know exactly who she was I know exactly what she was doing what she wanted to do with life what was important for her and as we evolve as a brand and start to meet these these women they are exactly who I imagined so I think it's in, in this project that I, I can say that um, I feel constantly the closest to to the realization of the vision of the of the flames expanding. And that's of course the moment when you founded your eponymous label in, um, in 2015 and I think you know artists sometimes have manifestos, uh, there is an ethos involved in the work, a mantra, I suppose it's the same also with, with fashion designers and you in previous conversations referred really to two main points in terms of the ethos or, or manifesto of your practice. One has to do with the long duration, the, what, what Fernand Baudel calls la longue durée. Long term view. And, yeah, and the other one is, uh, is the idea of, uh, of sustainability. Can you tell us a little bit about these two dimensions, which seem to be in everything you do? Yes, this, there are two, the, the company was founded with these two values, long term view and sustainability. And every decision is made every business decision every design decision is made in, in, with these two values so whenever we have a question we always go back to these two values uh, i think a pivotal moment for our company was when um our handbags becoming to come have a quite a big of a, a success and so it was a point where, where we decided that we did not want to sell it to other retail stores so we have our own stores um, and the reason you would do it is you wouldn't wholesale them. You would, it would take us double amount of natural resources to make the same amount of money. If we had, we would have um, wholesale them, which means uh, more natural resources out of this planet. The only reason that you would do it is because it's, you want to become your name very well known, very fast. And that doesn't go with our long-term view. So that was a decision that we made to just, restrict our growth and really grow organically. And I think that 
given the different circumstances that we've been navigating, I'm very happy that we took those steps. So every single decision that we've had, we have put ourselves, even if sometimes looks like not the most, you know, growth cash fast thing to do, it seems to be the one that it's it's not about it's about getting there. It's not about the speed of how you get there. Now, obviously, we are very interested in the ecological dimension, the sustainable dimension of, of your practice, because at the Serpentine, we started the Back to Earth project. So for our 50th anniversary, we wanted to look to the next 50 years, and we asked artists to do environmental campaigns. So not only yeah. artworks, not only exhibitions, but campaigns which have, are transformative and can actually produce reality. Um, and uh, that's really also how Elena uh, had the idea to connect us. And, uh, uh, and that sort of sustainable ecological dimension of your work sort of starts also with the details. It's, as you once said in an interview, it's about paying attention. And you've said that one of the things that you've done is to buy that stock from the top mills and, and, and go back also to this time which was not about owning many things, but was a, a time about owning less, where basically quantity you know, um, is less important maybe than, than quality. And I always remember my father, when I was about five or six years old, you know, bought the suit and he said that he really just wanted this suit to have it until the end of his life. And I think this yeah. idea of, of, and the same thing, you know, we have an exhibition right now by former Fantasma at the Serpentine, and they, the designers, and they looked at the, um, uh, they looked actually at timber and the timber industry, and they looked at the, the time an object made out of timber has to last to be sustainable. And they basically show us that, you know, an IKEA chair would actually have to be used for, you know, a century almost in order for it to be sustainable. Obviously, in reality, an IKEA stool isn't used for a century, so there is a problem. So this, I'm very interested in how, you know, this has a lot to do with paying attention. And it has a lot to do also um, with maybe owning less. Oh, there's so many interesting things of what you just said. Um, immediately, my mind went into my 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 dad's uh, uh, briefcase. He had once one on his all whole life, and it's one of the most beautiful objects I've ever seen. As you see, the leather deteriorates. Um, that's the only way I consume. Do I want this for the rest of my life? That's that's it. Um, you know, that's really the only way I, I consume anything. Obviously, I want to use that shampoo all the way down um, and buy, buy the bulk. But I think it's also really interesting what you said about the timber because I have a strong connection with, with trees. I think trees are the only technology that we know to man that can process carbon dioxide effectively. A lot of our environmental issues will be solved by at least 30% just by conservation. It takes a lot of resources to make a tree. I use only reclaimed tree. And then I can tell you that the store we did in, in, uh, with Norman and um, with Lord Foster in, in, in Mayfair, it's all reclaimed wood. Um, I, I think that it's, it's one of those, um, our lives in humans compared to the lives in trees, is, it's, it's, it's nothing. When I say 150 years that my family has been in one place, it's nothing to compare to the trees that have been there. Yeah. So I... There's so much I have respect I have for for the wisdom of 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 trees and I and I think that the, this is something that it's it's really part of my work how we can use we don't use viscose at all we don't even use their viscose is made out of celluloid and um and even if it's certified viscose which means that there were certified planted trees still takes a lot of water and time to create a tree even if it's done smartly. So all, all paper and everything we've done has to be recycled. And I stay away from viscose unless I find, you know, 2000 meters of dead stock because it already exists. So that is really something that I am really, really conscious about, um, about the technology that we already have available to process carbon dioxide and that's our trees. Now, as part of the Back to Earth project at Serpentine, we also involved Newton Harrison, who is one of the pioneering artists of ecological art. And mm -hmm. he has launched a campaign to criminalize plastic. And I think that's interesting because you also have a hatred of plastic. Yes. Um, you, find, you, you find it, uh, you know, you cannot describe it, you said, in another way. It's a hatred. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you found other materials. It's not about 
only about not using plastic, it's also about finding materials which could replace it. And I'm particularly interested in this tipper uh, created by Daphna Nissenbaum, a software engineer, uh, which is really a packaging alternative also. Can you tell us a little bit about your hatred of plastic and the alternative of tipper, which you use? So, so you know, plastic has inundated our lives um, in the past few decades and you can find micro uh, plastics in every single kingdom on earth and it's something that became obviously very practical but we never think of how it emerges and obviously as most inventions and you're it unless you're a psychopath happens because um, accidents or it's a short-term th thinking the reason why we use so much polyester and plastic in our in 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 our clothing, for example, is after Second World War, when there were all the restrictions to Italy, um, the fiber that they had access to was polyester, and the Italians, being so creative, created these most fantastic polyester fibers, and that became a boom. But we don't we forgot of how things become, um, and I I I think that for me so obvious that petroleum it becomes from fossil fuels which is just dead organisms from another geological time and that we need to take them out of our earth and burn them to eject it into the atmosphere that then uh, warms and acidifies the oceans so what is the alternative to we ban plastic from our company in the sense that we use only recyclable cups we have only filtered waters um, any company can do that from like a 20,000 people company to any company can do that very easily without any cost to them um, but what I found from the technologies that are out there TIPA was one of the first that does this biodegradable compostable flexible packaging and when we started they didn't even have when all garments are shipped they're shipped in 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 this way or they're shipped flat packed or hanging the hangers are usually also made in plastic which we change to recycle cardboard hangers and then there's a garment bag that's transparent so you see the garment that's how everything gets shipped or flat pack or hanging doesn't matter high end low end it's it's like that and so for me i became obsessed looking at people's clothes thinking of all the plastic that it was being shipped so with with daphne we developed that garment bag the prototype that now is used for other brands so we we were the first to develop that but now it's a able to be used so it's it actually biodegrades in in and compost in 24 weeks it's going to be more of an impact as compostable becomes more available in uh, in mm -hmm. around the world because right now only five percent gets uh, of all things com that can be compostable get compostable in the world so there's still a lot of work to do on that So you repurpose materials, you recycle materials, you work with new materials, these biodegradable materials. But then, of course, there is also the fashion shows, which are not carbon neutral. And um, a lot of discussion has actually, uh, over the last years, uh, been held about this idea, how could one make fashion shows more sustainable, more carbon neutral? Uh, and particularly now, I think it's so important um, after this, uh, COVID crisis, not to think, as Bruno Latour says, about going back to normal, because the normal um, was actually not normal. The normal is a path which leads us to extinction. So we, we in a way, yeah. um, have to think about, you know, different ways of, of, of programming also. We think, for example, at the certain time about slow programming, you know, the idea that maybe exhibitions also last longer. And I think that's a discussion which is also very present in the fashion world. You know, this, this relentless rhythm of fashion shows is being questioned. So I wanted to ask you about that, about this idea of, of slow programming. But then also, in addition to that, there's a sort of a second part of the question, how can one actually create a completely carbon neutral fashion show? Because you have in 2019, actually, in September 2019, for your spring summer show 2020, created as far as I know, the first ever carbon neutral runway show. And that, of course, was a collaboration with uh, an advisory group, EcoAct. And I think a lot of things had to be considered, uh, not to travel at the same time, of course, also the way electricity is used. Uh, can you tell us about, uh, yeah, first of all, the idea of slow programming, how 
you know, to kind of deal with this relentless rhythm and how to slow it down and how to maybe avoid it. And at the same time, then also how, how can one create a completely carbon neutral runway show? Because I hope that others can learn from your example. So we always had a different calendar than most people in the sense that we do two shows a year, not eight. Um, and we always, and even like our pre-fall collection is all, always done by sketches. We don't even develop samples, but we have a close relationship with our accounts that they trust on our product and the quality of our product so we can manage that. But many years ago when I started to 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 do Gavrila Hurst and there was more and more interest in the press, I decided that the only thing I was always going to communicate was, the, you know, what you said correctly, is the crisis that is, is going to drive us to extinction. And, you know, when I hear my kids discussing if they'll have children or not in the future, because maybe that's not something that they can do, you know, you, 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 you cannot be on the sidelines. So the platform that we created has always been to communicate uh, what we're doing and what, with that said, we never do the things perfect. And as I say, nobody's doing it perfect, but you have to put yourself out there and find ways of how to, to improve. So, um, it happened when we started doing the store in London where we started to think, how, what was our impact? Our impact has always been like, if we want to open a store, why does the environment want to suffer? But that's how I personally and professionally think. If, I, if, I, if my husband wanted to have a house outside of the city and I'm like, okay, we're gonna have a place in the country, it has to be sustainably made because why does the environment have to suffer? Because you know we wanna go hang out in nature. So everything is reclaimed, everything is recycled. So the way, I work personally is the same as professionally. There's no divide on that. So the fashion shows are always a vehicle for us to think about things and communicate what we're thinking. So I started to think, I had my cholesterol exam that was very high. And my doctor told me, it's not your diet, it's your exercise. So I started to exercise and my cholesterol came down. So when I started to think about the fashion shows, how can we lower our carbon footprint of the show, of a company, if we're not measuring it, how, how we don't have those numbers. We didn't have the d data. So the initial thought process was we need to measure the carbon footprint. And then working with EcoAct, they gave us the option of this, what you can do to make it carbon neutral, which is basically they pair you with a, a UN gold standard, sustainable non for profit where it's basically doing the carbon neutral is, is basically writing a tip on the check, right? an extra good thing to do the best thing to do is like do the least possible carbon footprint so that's what we did and on the second show so we measure our uh, we already knew what to do even less mm -hmm. to lower like no flowers right um things that you would never think of um it's ob obviously was a much better to have a vegetarian only um, meal for the carbon footprint. The two big emitters in our industry in general are raw materials and transportation. That occupies like 50% of the greenhouse gas emitters. So we, we had the electricity, we did all the hairstyles with no electricity, um, which was in really interesting, nobody missed. It's like you subtract things and that you think you need and then you realize you don't and nobody noticed the difference and it's, it's really um, uh, elevating as well. And the second show, we use the concept of waste. Because as I said to you before, I've, I've, we are right now on the pandemic crisis, which is very visual for people, but I've already been working in my mindset in another crisis, which is the environmental crisis, which will extinct us. I don't think the pandemic will extinct us. I do think the environmental crisis will. So with that notion that waste is a design flaw because it doesn't exist in nature, in nature, our last show in February was about reusing. Everything was repurposed. The set was made with uh, paper veils that were taken from our recycle facility, where immediately after the show, they were brought back to the recycle facility to continue their process. Uh, we made notebooks from all the extra paper that we had in our office that we've used from the photocopies machines. We actually made notebooks for all our guests in order. So people think paper is precious. When I was a little kid, we saved every little piece of paper. 
And um, so it, it was, it's really about using those shows to show how precious the thing that we become accustomed to be excessive on. Wonderful, and of course, there is the show, there is the collection, and then there are the stars. And um, it's not a coincidence that you decided to collaborate with uh, Norman Foster, because of course, uh, Norman is uh, an incredible inspiration for environmental design ever since the 60s, also with his collaboration with Buckminster Fuller. Uh, we, one of the first conversations in this series actually was with Norman and we talked a lot about sustainable cities also. Norman has of course designed the uh, European headquarters for Mike Bloomberg, for Bloomberg in London, and that is the world's uh, most sustainable office building. Now it's interesting that actually when you asked Norman to design the star, the, the brief was that it would have to be and has to be the most sustainable star ever made. Um, and as you say, it has to be an evolution not a revolution from the New York star. Can you tell us a little bit about, about the star? Uh, you already mentioned a bit before, but it would be great to hear more. Let's put it like this, it would be great. So I'm gonna start this question again, so this has to be edited. It would be great to hear more about the star and about your collaboration with Norman Foster. So it was very much, um, we knew we wanted to open a, a store and uh, we emailed Norman, um, to, to if he would recommend us a, a sustainable architect. Uh, and he's like, why not me? So we were thrilled with this, uh, with this uh, opportunity. And it, I was in London in January of 2019 and I asked come out of uh, the, the hotel, the Claridge's Hotel, I saw this beautiful corner store and I'm like, that's, that's the place. And, um, and it was this beautiful building and, and Norman liked it as well. And, it when they did the history of the original architect which was also an environmentalist um which is there's so many coincidences in, in, in that and serendipities and norman as you said is one of the pioneers of art of sustainably architecture so we knew we were in good hands and and they went to the extent of finding the flooring our stores our parquet flooring herringbone pattern is part of our branding um the, the herringbone stitch and 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 so they found these parquet floors from the second world war from military barracks in, in wales in the north of wales that they had to be the pain striking um exercise because they had to take them out clean them and put them all by hand the only way you can do them is by hand and then all the, the wood is made out, um, the fixtures are made by fallen uh, London pine trees on a storm. So every little bit is thought, is in or was in the thought process of how we could maximize and make a beautiful store. There's no, there's no mannequins, there's no window displays. There's a simplicity and a warmth and, in, and an in, invitation to come to this place. And you still feel that you're in a luxury environment, um, but, that that it has this um, very beautiful aesthetic when there is enough and not too less either. Now, one of the things which is extraordinary about about meeting Norman, about spending time with Norman, about working with Norman, is really the presence of drawing. And um, oh. I'm always very fascinated that I mean, we once went to see Oscar Niemeyer together because he had never met Oscar Niemeyer, so we arranged uh, a conversation in actually uh, Rio, so that, oh, wow. uh, because it was also, uh, it was both their wish. I mean, Oscar wanted to meet Norman, Norman wanted to meet Oscar, so we organized it. And Elena uh, actually published a book of this, of this meeting. Um, and it was quite extraordinary because it's the first time, and I've seen it since then many times, that he really draws whenever there is a moment. It can be in a, in a break, it can be, in a car, it can be on a train. There is always a notebook and he, he writes and, and draws. And you often ref, reference also an anecdote about this mm -hmm. attention to detail, about the way how he can capture immediately in a drawing a feeling. Can you tell us about this? Because I think it has to do with a display yeah. feature he designed for your bags, no? Yeah, he was, so we were looking at the renderings in, in his office, in the, in, the, in the offices in London and, 
and he was looking at them and all of a sudden he sees that in a bench he actually that's in the in the in the store he we should have a book display underneath and he probably looked at this bench on a rendering paper for five seconds and then he sketched what he wants in a speed that I've never seen with an accuracy that I can spend my whole lifetime sketching. I will never even get close to that sketch. And I have a natural ability. So it's, it's just like, that's when you, you know, when you're in the presence of master, masterfulness. And so I think that that was, it was such a small moment, but it's such a impact on my, on me of knowing, okay, this is how greatness really looks like. <laughs> Maybe two last questions. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you is also about your involvement with char charitable causes. Very often you donate all profits of a collection actually to charitable causes. There's particularly the, the, the important project we Save the Children, which has to do also with the, uh, with the war in Yemen. Can you tell us a little bit about that dimension of your, your practice? So I actually started working with Save the Children through the climate crisis. In 2017, there was a drought in Africa, in the Horn of Africa, uh, that was having 20 million people in the risk of, of famine. And, and that was something that, that it's climate injustice, what it really um, you know, fires me up in the sense that the people that do the least pay the highest price. So I had to go see it with myself, with my own eyes. And when I heard that Save the Children was going in a collective with the global response on a trip to Turkana in the north of Kenya, I said, I wanted to go. And so when I, what I saw there changed me forever. I saw mass screenings for malnutrition, women that dig holes for water, eight hours to get a little bit of water in dry river beds. I mean, it's, it's, it was, um, I felt like I had to do something. And at that time, it wasn't, you know, I remember talking to a friend that was a CEO of a very successful fashion luxury brand. And he said, I don't know if I, I would use your bags in this. And I told him I have to, I have to collect the money because the problem was so big, but at least I wanted to, I cannot just go see that and do nothing about it. So I wanted to at least help the 1,050 um, families in the area. So I asked uh, Save the Children Kenya to calculate how much money we needed. And it was $600,000. So. I came in the plane saying I have to I have to do my bags, sell my bags. I have to create these six hundred thousand dollars. So I called Neda Porte and Bergdorf and I told them, I'll give you the bags for a week because I wouldn't call sell them and you get you take with your money, I'll give mine to save the children. And uh, I remember my husband saying to me, Don't you think that next time you think you're giving six hundred thousand dollars, you need to you need to talk to me? Because I remember sighing the compromise of like, we're getting this money, we're doing this. And we sold the we sold the bags. It was like a record. In like in three days, we had collected the money. So we've used our platform to also create. When I see Yemen is a conflict that also I've been following for for years now, and it breaks my my heart because actually it's not an environmental crisis. It's a man inflicted crisis, and most of the crises we're seeing some are environmental, but this one is um, inflicted um, by war and by so many. Um, unfair circumstances and it breaks me it breaks me that the, the 14 million people now are in the risk of some famine in, in, in Yemen and and I, when I started reading I started crying and I'm like who are my tears helping and they're helping no one so that's why we decided that you know the holidays were coming what is the best thing to do let's try to raise aware for Yemen because it wasn't losing traction you know how the news cycles are today so it wasn't losing traction so we did this with Save the Children UK and um, and Save the Children uh, US to 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 create um, funds for the for for the Yemen conflict, which is one of the hells on earth right now. Maybe two last questions. One question that's for the editing uh, for Antonia. We can add it a little bit earlier in the conversation when. We talked about ecology uh, and you gave me this beautiful answer. I had a follow-up question there, which we can insert there. Um, when we spoke yesterday, Gabriela, you, you said we belong to nature, but nature does not belong to us. 
And you also said that it's a mirror. If it's sick, yes. we are sick. Can, can you tell us about that? So intrinsically, because I still have the way I grew up, very clear where, where things come from. And my, my, I'm connected to understanding that we, be, we belong to nature and nature doesn't belong to us. And, um, and it's, it's a complete reflex of the extinction that's happening and in the sickness that's happening in our environment is also happening to us. And you can see it in many levels. You can see it from um, our microbes that have also been extinct, microbes that have been with us for hundreds of thousands of years or millions in, in some cases, in some species, are being also extinct. So I think that that ex mass extinction that's happening on the outside is also happening in our or organism. So we are a mirror. And sometimes living in cities, we forget that, but because it's just not connecting in our in narrow pathways. And then the very last question, that's always the last question in, in the interview. So we're gonna insert this wonderful answer before when we talk about ecology, and now we go back to the end of the interview. Uh, the last question is always a question about the unrealized project. I'm very interested in unrealized projects because we know a lot about architects' unrealized projects because they often publish them. And often actually their unrealized projects get realized because of them being published. And strangely, we know very little about visual artists, poets, novelists, fashion designers, scientists, unrealized projects, which is why I'm always interested in these projects uh, in order to maybe, you know, also help facilitate their realization, create awareness. And there is, of course, many reasons why a project is unrealized. It can be too big to be realized. It can be too small to be realized. Silvio Meireles once wanted, the Brazilian artist Silvio Meireles once wanted to put a tiny, tiny little cube yeah. and have the entire museum empty. And it took him, you know, 30, 40 years to convince the museum to do that. So that project was too small to be realized. Some projects are forgotten They're in a locker. Uh, some projects are unrealized because they are lost petition entries. That's a lot with public art. Some projects are utopic, utopias. Some projects are unrealizable. Uh, then, of course, there are also the sense of project. And my friend Doris Lessing always said there are also the projects we haven't dared to do, basically. The projects which are self-censored, we haven't had the courage to do yet. And I think we all have such unrealized projects. So I wanted to ask you what are the unrealized projects or some of the unrealized yes. projects? Of <laughs> I, think some is a, I think some is the right way to do it because there are many. <laughs> um, I think one of one of them that it's a dream that I've had for for many years, and and um, some of them are are being done by others, which I'm very happy that somebody else is doing it. So, but one of them is the one of the unrealized projects is the um, idea of a, of a refugee uh, cottage industry. So. What are we going to do with our our all the refugees in, in the world that is increasing in population and very very very, very talented um, individuals and thinking of this as a as a workforce be, before the industrial revolution we had the cottage industry which were basically farmers that in their downtown time they would create laces or buttons everything was made on this downtime. So I had always had this idea, maybe it's, and I, I tried to investigate it a few years ago of really um, when the, the emergence of the refugee crisis happening and, I, and the understanding that this was not going to go away, this was a reality that we were going to have to live and, and collaborate was how do we train people to do this craft and this joy of, of, of creating beautiful products. So doing cottage industry, that would be uh, leather goods, uh, lace. And so this was one of those projects that I really would like to, um, as, as I say the case of Elsa Scaparelli that did her first collection with Armenian refugees knitwear. So that was something that it's something of mine. Another one is, it's called Trash Day which I want to, you know how when children are starting to go to the museums and learn about the wonderful uh, achievements of civilization, yeah. I want them to have trash day. So I want them to go to landfills and understand so it can go into their brains of what is happening with all the waste that we're consuming, where it ends. So I, that's one thing I would love to lobby for, trash day. And also I would love to have this 
this um, non for profit, which would actually help people understand uh, housewood that you would have consultants come to your house. And if you, if you are able to afford it to pay, you pay the consultants and, and families that don't have the income to get it for free. That's why it needs to be a low for profit that tells you because it's becoming very complicated when somebody's selling you bamboo toilet paper and telling you this is eco-friendly when it's not right. So really to have this specialist of teaching you how to maintain your house and how to maintain your, your existence with reteaching you, you don't actually need this. You need to use vinegar and and lemon to clean this you know to really bring it down and kind of cut out the marketing that is telling you you need to buy this product this is eco-friendly when it's not to really clear up because it have become very confusing for a lot of people these are wonderful are projects <laughs> these are wonderful projects Gabriela. thank you so much a very very last question a very last question is actually you're just about to uh actually present virtually a new, um, a new collection. It's a pandemic uh, collection, and uh, we're very grateful for your time because it happens really during these days, yeah. which are so busy for you. So again, our gratitude for taking time for, for the Serpentine. Can you tell us about your pandemic collection? So my pandemic collection is actually um, really, it's, it's so couture. I would say it's so handcrafted. Um, I was that it's you know because I have this feeling that after this finish people are just gonna get their Lululemon leggings and and jogging pants and create a big bonfire of all this. So I actually went even into a more dream world of handcraft and exquisite um, techniques in very noble and rustic material. So we will build this couture type of sleeves in linen. Um, so contrasting contrasting soft and rustic the, there's lace that's made out of leather so there's a lot of craftsmanship and we shot it on on my sister that's a scientist uh, riding bareback and myself because the safest thing was to have a a, um, a very uh, tight knit so it was my sister and I riding horses um, that was shot by a photographer and our stylist in, in California and, and it was really incredible to see the the, the moving of the pieces on writing bareback. So it'll be published this week, so you'll see it. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much. This was an amazing Thank conversation. You. And you, I Alex. hope we can uh, continue. It has only just begun and do more things together. Oh, please. I would love to. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.